thanks so much for coming out tonight. We want you to know what Measure J really is compared to all of the nonsense you're getting in the mail about what it's not, really. Um, I've, uh, I think I'm going to call this the lie repeated a thousand times campaign on Cal Am's part because that's really what they're doing. It's the same lie over and over again, the same five lies. My name is Melody Chrislock, and our director, George Riley, and I will be your presenters tonight. I'm um, interested in a show of hands. How many people are familiar with public water now, have been to a presentation? So there's, there's quite a few of you that haven't. Okay. So, and let me ask you to hold your questions till the end. We'll leave plenty of time. It's a small group tonight, so we'll have plenty of time to answer everybody's questions. Am I loud enough for everyone? Good? Up? I don't have control of the volume. All I can do is get closer. Okay, closer? All right. Will do. So, Public Water Now is a local nonprofit organization with about 3,500 supporters. We're just citizens like the rest of you. I got involved because my water bill was reaching $600 a month about five, six years ago, and I was going crazy trying to figure out what is happening here. So, it's been a long effort for a lot of volunteers in Public Water Now. We've always been about promoting affordable, sustainable water. We've done about 50 public educational forums over the last four years. And we put Measure O on the ballot four years ago. And we lost by six points when Calam put up $2.5 million against us. So we're up against the same kind of thing now, but <clears throat> we have a considerable headway this time. So, Calum's, one of Calum's big claims is it's a government takeover. And I, I think that is really disingenuous. I mean, this is a public buyout at fair market value. It's got nothing to do with government seizure or anything like that. And they also have had fun saying, oh, if this passes, you have no choice. Well, I don't know what choice you have when you open your cal bill. <clears throat> I certainly don't feel like I have any choice except to write that check every month for hundreds of dollars. So, what we're looking for is a choice. They've also been trying to say that if this passes, you're writing the local agency, the Monterey Peninsula Water Management District, a blank check. That is absolutely not true. And then one of their big ones, I love this one. This one is really, this is one of the serious lies, that no government takeover in the last 20 years in California has resulted in lower costs. All you have to do is call anybody in Ojai, call their water department, their costs went down, horrendously down, 65% lower, some of them after their public buyout. And that's with the cost of the buyout, with the cost of repairing their system, and the water rates are still lower. So, Calam is just, you know, saying anything these days, but one of the real reasons that they're, they can say this, that there's no government agency, so there's only been five public buyouts of water in California in the last 20 years. Anybody have an idea why that is? Everybody else owns their water. Because 83% of California already owns, publicly owns their water. We're in this tiny little group still that is having a private water purveyor charge us profits on our water. So, Measure J, what it is, is it requires, passing Measure J will require the Water Management District an already existing agency that you've elected, you have a representative on a board of seven members, and you can contact them. You probably you may not know who they are yet, but you will shortly because now they'll become a lot more important once Calam is out of control of things. So what happens is Measure J passes, the Water Management District is then required by law to do a feasibility study. 
This feasibility study will cost about a half a million dollars, and it is paid for by the Water Management District out of their reserves. It's not going to cost us anything. It's already money that's been paid into their accounts. So once that happens, and in fact, right before that happens, what they're going to do is they have said that because some people have complained about, well, what does feasible mean? And I mean, feasible means we can afford to do it. So, but they are going to hold public hearings as soon as Measure J passes and bring the public in, ask you what you think is feasible. How should they define feasible before they move forward with the feasibility study? So once that happens, and they have some criteria for what is feasible, like are we going to say, well, we can't raise our rates at all for five years, or we have to lower our rates, or we can raise them by 5% over five years, or whatever the community really has to give input on this and decide what is feasible. So once that happens, then they take that feasibility criteria and they move forward with hiring expert specialist consultants in different areas that will compile this feasibility study. And then that will show us, that will give us the real cost, real estimate, a real solid estimate of just how much CalAM is likely to cost. So, CalAM says they're worth $1.04 billion. Nobody that knows anything about the numbers, the way this works, believes that. It's, it is pie in the sky, as one of their recent flyers was talking about. They used a company by the name of MR Valuations, and um, I'll tell you more about MR Valuations in a minute. But I wanted to say something about this Felton promised residents a $2 million buyout. That never happened. That's another lie. We're quite familiar with the people in Felton. They've talked to us a lot. They've helped us. They've given us a lot of background. $2 million was the cost that Calam paid for their system four years before the buyout. Not what Felton asked. And four years later, their opening bid, Calam said, we want 46 million. So it went from 46 million to then when they ended up getting into an appraisal situation that was more realistic, it dropped to what Calam wanted was 25.6 million. And it ended up selling to Felton for 13 million, a third of what Calam originally asked for, which it seems to be pretty. Um, a pretty typical pattern because we looked at a number of other public water buyouts and you can see that like Ojai started at 120 million and ends up selling for 34 million. Carlisle and Missoula asked for 200 million and sold for, the court ordered it sold for 88 million. So the MR valuations back to them. Um, Missoula used, uh, the Carlisle, owned Missoula system. Carlisle used MR valuations to get that $200 million valuation that then the court said, no, 88, that's what you can have. So when you see that billion dollar claim, um, take it with a lot of salt. But the way that they're using this, see they start with this $1.04 billion dollars then they back it up, and then they start doing their math on this false claim, and that's how they come to the conclusion that your water bills will go up under public ownership, because they start with a false figure. So this is the, this is the game that they're playing right now, and water companies have what's called a base rate, or a rate base, sorry, I was reverse it. It's a rate base, and it's what they make their guaranteed revenue on from the California Public Utilities Commission. It's, it's not an elusive number. It's their value as far as what they get to charge. They, they make their money on their, on their equity plus. Their rate base is their equity plus their debt. So that's where they get to a guaranteed profit from the state government. So their rate base is $125 million right now. 
And typically, that, maybe twice that would be about what a public utility would sell for. So it all kind of points to somewhere in the neighborhood of maybe 300 million. No one can say what it will really be in the end, but you can get pretty close to a ballpark by looking at past buyouts, by knowing what their rate base is, by knowing what their stock value is. Um, their parent company, American Water, the whole thing all over the country is only worth about 15 billion. And we are in no way 15th of that. So that's, um, that's what, uh, that's how we, that's where we get all this outrageous cost. So I want to turn it over to our director, George Riley, for a few minutes. He's got some more for you. Thank you. It's nice uh, seeing a crowd and our favorite subject, <laughs> cal -Am and water and the cost all the way around. Um, one thing I just want to add on to what Melody was just saying about the uh, rate base and cal -Am's, uh stated value and so on. You know, when you buy something, whether it's a car or a house or something, it's going to take some time for you to make a decision. Uh, it's usually a negotiation. It's somewhere you start, what you think you can afford or what you think you want to kind of offer. And then the other side has an offer, has the other side of that equation. So somewhere in the middle is probably a real number that both parties could agree to if both parties want to agree to it. So it's a negotiation. So when Callahan says they give you the side says public agencies don't understand uh, utility value, and therefore they put the low number in saying public agencies are stupid. That's the low end of the, of the offer side. And even Kellyanne exaggerates what the low side is, like they did in Felton. But Kellyanne never tells you their side of the equation. So when we look it up and find out the other side of the equation, there's a range. Kellyanne has a value they feel they're, they're, uh, it's a fair value. The public agencies feel like it's a much lower value, and that's a negotiation. So it's not exact. It's not exact science at all. And if you've ever bought a home or ever bought an expensive car, you know that somewhere in there, you may agree, you may not agree. But that's what the feasibility study will. It'll identify the highs, it'll identify the lows, it'll identify the issues in between. And if it seems like it's affordable or it can be affordable to the community or workable, then that's the end of the feasibility study. It's to get to a number. That's the purpose of the feasibility study. But let me just go back to, to I mean, pick up where I'm supposed to pick up. Calams mailers, want you to forget a lot of things. And they want to put other things in your brain so that that's what you think about. Like one billion dollars, you can't afford it, therefore give up. Or vote no, because it's a waste. But you look, all the, you look at all the flyers that are, you, you're getting. And if you want to spend time with all that stuff, it's just storyland. They make a statement that they, they claim we make, and then they shoot it down and say vote no. But they make up the statements. The $1 billion, for example, is a recent number that they've put out. But if you read your voter guide, that number says 700 million. So Callahan's own argument for the no side has two numbers in it. And the most recent one is a million dollars, which is supposed to scare you, and the 700 million, which is supposed to be scary too. But it's, it's a feasibility study in order to understand what those numbers are and what's behind them. So, Kelly wants you to forget. They have the most expensive water in the United States. And we didn't do that study. Somebody else did. Food and Water Watch. They did a national survey with a common background and, um, and uh, uh, I mean, a common criteria. And we have the most expensive water in the country. Why wouldn't everybody be interested in looking at why is that? Or if it's, if it's exactly true or not, if you don't trust the agency and so on, then get the real information. But it's the only bona fide public uh, research nationwide on the cost of water. There's no other study out there like this. And Callahan doesn't cite another study to argue with us. So if somebody else says it and they did a real study and they say we're the most expensive water in the country, Everybody ought to be up in arms, I think. And, and the facts are backed up. It's a highly footnoted uh, uh, document that uh, Food and Water Watch did.
So I'm, I've forgotten my system here. That one, okay. Go to that one. So uh, what you have here in blue, this is the national survey that was done by Food and Water Watch. 500 different water companies were in that study, including us. Uh, but the blue is the, co the average cost um, on the far left. The blue is the national average. And the orange is the national average of private water. Substantial difference. The next two bars in, in California. The uh, blue bar, again, public ownership. And the private company still higher. That's the point. That was the point of the survey. What's the, what's the difference in the public cost and the corporate cost of water? That was the nature of the study. And these are the numbers that the study generated in California and nationally. And then us. This last column is us. It's the cost of our water. This is why we're pushing as hard as we are for J, pushing as hard as we are for a feasibility study, pushing as hard as we uh, can on getting all the facts on where the... Can we afford to buy Cal-Am? And if we can, can the rates change? And all that's tied into the study. We're not the authorities on this. But these facts just yell at us. And they should yell at you. This one? Cal-Am wants, wants you to forget their failures. Now, they're on, they're on the hook for water. They're supposed to be on the hook for uh, creating a water supply. They're supposed to be on the hook for um, just planning ahead. So what they did is they tell us to conserve, we conserve, and then they go through the back door. So we paid $64 million for water we didn't ask for, they didn't deliver, we didn't use, but it's a money deal. It's not a water deal, it's a money deal. And they went back to the PUC and said, you told us we could make this much money, we didn't sell enough water to make that much money, so it's not a water issue, it's a budget issue. And they went back to the PUC and said, this difference, $64 million, is something that you promised us, you the PUC, because you approved our budget. Well, PUC says yes, and so that's what happened. We didn't, we didn't use the water. Cal Ham told us not to use the water. And then they go and have this avenue back through the PUC, which we didn't know about at the time until they started having this big process. And then we started even getting more upset. But they've also gone down several paths to de develop a new water supply three times, and um, all three have failed. They tried a Carmel River dam, a different dam. Uh, this was after the vote to turn down a dam. So then Cal said, Cal Am said, well, we can do better than that. So they came back with another dam proposal. It doesn't sound exactly right, but it also does sound right. <laughs> anyway, that one failed. They had a pilot project up in Moss Landing for desal. That failed, the regional desal project. Uh, with Marina and the county as partners. That failed. Um, and they sent us the bill for the expenses that they incurred in order to pursue those projects. But they all failed. Now, usually a corporation who, the, the, the at-risk capital is what stockholders are all about. They're putting money in, they expect to have, have it at risk in some fashion based on whatever the market dynamics are and, and, and the profit side of it. Um, and so, they're, but they're protected, their, their risk capital is protected by the PUC. So when they fail, stockholders pay nothing. We paid for their failures, not the stockholders. They tore down the, Carmel, the San Clemente Dam. Uh, it's still on their website where it says they spent $49 million. The real number is over $150 million. Um, they're just not telling you the truth. Uh, in terms of how they treat the environment, or how they treat the water supply, or how they treat the very product that they're dealing with in order to serve us as, as their customers. Uh, they've overdrafted the Carmel River. The order from the state was directed to cal -Ann. Not to the water district, not to ratepayers, not to the cities, but to cal -Ann. You have failed in, in, your, in your management of the, of the Carmel River uh, water source. You have failed. Uh, Cal-Am wants you to forget that. They overdrafted. They, after Carmel River, they moved to the uh, Seaside Basin. There's an aquifer, there's a basin there. Uh, they, over, they overdrafted that. That led to adjudication. 
which means there's a legal oversight structure established by a court system to monitor what happens in that basin. Now, we back up the, the Carmel River overdraft has a state oversight structure built in with the cease and desist order. So Callahan not only just overdrafted and moved somewhere, they overdrafted, were caught by the state, ordered by the state, and monitored by, by the state to, to, to correct for that problem. That's Carmel River. There's a local court system that's monitoring the process in the Seaside Basin. Callahan has no track record of producing any water since they've owned the system. They've owned it for 52 years. Their current desal is more flawed than you can imagine. Uh, and that's just not a judgment question with us. There are all sorts of parties to the process at the PUC said there's a lower cost alternative and it doesn't have to be desal. And there were, there were debates about this, the, the demand side, which means what we demand, what we want, how much water we want. There was a, um, a process uh, developed which PUC asked for to find an alternative to Calhoun's desal. So the public agencies got involved, got, got together, proposed an alternative to the PUC. The PUC said, no, we're not interested. We're only interested in desal. They approved the desal recently, about a month ago. Uh, that project has no water rights. That project is uh, taking marina's groundwater. Now look at the pattern here. They were in the Carmel River, overdrafted, had to move somewhere, moved to Seaside Basin. Overdrafted, now they're moving north again, farther north. Now they're up in Marina's watershed. They're in the district where there is a water district already existing with service responsibilities and, um, and, and, and a, a, a high volume of water that they need for their own future. The Calam got the permission from the state to go ahead and stick their straw in Marina's groundwater. They have no water rights, and now they're in their third place, the third location where they want to go. They want to forget about that. Our water rates have already doubled. And then we get accused sometimes that we don't have a water supply solution, public water now. We're a bunch of citizens. We're not engineers and financiers and bond council and uh, anything to gain from anything that would happen with a water supply. That's not, our, that's not our business. Our business is we're looking at public ownership as an option. And all we want is the facts that, to, do, to look at that option. If the facts show that it's a feasible alternative, to a public ownership that's a feasible alternative to Calam's corporate ownership, then that's what we want to know. We want to know the facts. And then we can have a discussion. And in terms of re desal, we do think there's going to be desal in the future. And you should you should think that too. The question is when and how large and then how much how much is going to cost and who's going to pay for it. We think there's a regional solution out there. There was one just about 10 years ago. And Calam pulled the plug on it. That's one of the failures we say. Uh, but there are other places around that need water. I mean, uh, Marina needs water, Fort Ord needs water, Paro needs water, even up as far as uh, Soquel and Santa Cruz needs water. We on the peninsula need water. There's a regional potential here, uh, and we, we do support that look. So in general, we're saying we've had 50 years of Calam, we've had 50 years of failure, we had 50 years of what we think are mismanagement of the watersheds that they're in, and mismanaging, I, I don't know, they can't explain the skyrocketing cost. They can't explain it. But we want to have an option, and we think public water is the solution, and we just want to join, like the rest of the United States, 85 or so percent already have public water. Why? Why are we 15 percent? Why don't we look at that? having the highest cost water in the entire United States, you ought to try to figure out how you can vote twice for this. It's a, it's a big deal, and we need some answers. And that's, that's all we're asking for. Um, just take, just do a simple little math about the way the water, uh, the way your water bill works. Cost of water, and you add profit, and you get Calam's bill. Public water, cost of water, no profit no. equals your bill. That's a, simple, that's a simple approach to it, and we think it's the right approach. Profit in water is wrong, or water for profit is wrong. That's another principle that we operate under. And, if, and it's not a question of whether that's a determining factor. What's the, what's, what's the, what does it look like? 
What are the details? What do the, the facts look like if we were to compare public ownership with corporate ownership, the existing structure with Calium? If we were to have that for our local discussion, if we get the facts, we can have a serious discussion. Uh, so, and more than anything, Calium is driven by profit. The incentives for through through the PUC builds in that incentive structure. We're just saying we ought to have local control, or at least we ought to have an opportunity to consider local control. And their seaside, their, their uh, watershed management just shows that they're not stewards of water. They're stewards of the money, the money, the money track. We say we're a cash cow to Calam. If we got the most expensive water in the country, and we and we are a cash cow to them, that's why they're fighting as hard as they are. Back to uh, back to uh, Melody. So, we, I covered this, but I'll say it once more. The whole point of Measure J is to find out if we can afford to buy a Calam. That's what it does. That's all it's really about. But if we can, it does require the Water Management District to move forward in negotiating with Calam to buy them. If it's feasible, then they're required to pursue a buyout. That negotiation, we don't know how that would end. No one can say, but if it looks like it's feasible in the first place, and Calam says, no, we're not budging from our billion dollar figure, then it goes to an eminent dom a domain case where a judge and a jury will decide what the fair price is. So this is how Measure J would work. Um, like, and we mentioned already that the feasibility study is required by law Water Management District has to do it within nine months. So who is the Water Management District? Does everybody know who the Water Management District is? Or do you know who your representative is on that seven-person board? Come on, let me see. How many people know? Okay, so they're still kind of a ghost in the machine here, even though they were created in 1978. And they've been doing a lot of good things for us, quietly, humbly. Well, Calam keeps sending us millions of dollars in flyers telling us what great things they're doing. <clears throat> so, they are, the Water Management District is absolutely transparent, accessible, answerable to voters. But the really main, important, amazing thing is that in 25 years, they've developed 7,000 acre feet of the water that we use now, Calam has developed nothing, just promises. Remember that ad about the desal on the horizon? You know, like four years ago when they were trying to defeat Major Oak? That was, um, I think that must have been a mirage because it never manifested. It's still on the horizon. So that 7,000 acre feet can, is, you know, Right now, this whole community only uses 9,900 acre feet of water a year. So when you look at the 7,000 compared to what we use, that is an incredible amount of water that they have developed for our use. So if I were going to trust somebody with a water supply issue, I think it would be them, not Cal Am, personally. Um, so the process, I think I covered this already. The, um, once Major J passes, there's public hearings on what the feasibility criteria would be. Then they hire expert consultants. Then they do public hearings on the results of the study. And then, if feasible, they begin negotiations and move to eminent domain if it doesn't work out. Kennelly, I won't negotiate. So, we can buy. Here's the thing that Kennelly never puts in any of their brochures. They don't want anybody to think about this. Calam, and George will get into more of this in a minute, Calam, it looks like from their CPUC numbers that they take about 25% profit a year. And that is the money we use to buy them. So that 20, they have to report their yearly earnings to the CPUC. In 2016, their earnings were $60 million. So the amount left after their 
cost of operations and their corporate taxes was $19 million. We call that profit. So they actually, what would happen is that you could use that $19 million to pay off bonds every year. So it's not like you're taking your current water cost and adding the cost of the buyout on top of it because you are offsetting it with profit that you no longer pay to a public agency. And that is the beauty of this, and that's how it works, so that you don't have to raise water rates to buy a company that might be worth hundreds of millions of dollars, which sounds like a lot, but when you look at $19 million a year, just leaving our community, going back to New Jersey to their parent company, you could use that to buy them. Why not? So, um, George, let's see, I think, I'm going to give it back to you for a second. Yeah. The, um, this pie chart, uh, Kellyanne uh, doesn't like it, and they've told us so, um, but we're just using their numbers. We just put it in a pie chart. That's all we did. They're required to file annually with PUC their cost, um, uh, cost report for a year. Uh, we had a committee, a fiscal committee, uh, involved in this. It was a CPA, an uh, economics professor, two people who ran businesses, uh, me, and, and then somebody else who had been a corporate executive. So there was five, uh, six of us, I think, on the committee. Uh, anyway, we looked at Catalan's numbers, and this is the result. This is the pie chart that we got. Um, start out with 60 million. That's reported by Cal Am. This is 2016 in their annual report. Uh, they took, took in $60 million, 59800 and something or other. Just writing off here for 60, 60 million. And then all the blue is documented in their reports as an expense of running the local system. That's more than half, the blue. Also documented in their reports are the green. The green are off-site services. Call center, lab work, billing, but it's off-site, it's not here. But that's the cost, cost of doing business. So the blue and the green are all tied into delivering water locally. And it's in their report, they, they a lot of line items. We just added them up, summarizing. Uh, the gold, the, um, the yellow, is corporate taxes. If, there's, if it's publicly owned, there are no corporate taxes. Public agencies do not pay, pay corporate taxes. But that's where, um, that's where the, the, the big difference comes in is um, a part of it, and the other is the red, which I'll get to. So documented in Callahan's own reports, the blue, the green, the gold. That's about 75% of their budget. Then the accounting stops. They don't tell you anything more. But they did tell you they took in 60 million. So we took, whatever it is, 45 million? I mean, you know, but the, but the last, I mean, the, anyway, so three-fourths of 60 is the blue, green, and orange, and the one-fourth that's left is unaccounted for. We call it profit. Callum says no, and we, it's 25% of that. Um, Callum says no, we're only authorized 10%. Well, but what's this number? It's way, way, way more than 10%. All we know from the, from the accounting system that is used by cal -AM and the PUC and is available to the public is how much did they make? They reduce all their costs and what's left over? Blue, green, orange. Their cost. What's left over? It's revenue after expenses. It's not always called profit. It's sometimes just called revenue after expenses. But it's a real number. Because Callahan gave it to the PUC and we got it. So now going back to what Melody was saying, if there's a buyout and there's a need to finance a bond, which there would be, the money for the bond would come from the red and the orange because they're not on your bill anymore. They would be removed. But the money's still collected in your bill. So using the same money that you're collecting now could be used to, to, um, to buy the system or pay off the bond. And my analogy is renting a house versus buying a house. You need a place to stay, you're gonna pay something, and you get, you get a return. I mean, you, you get a service, you get a place to stay, and you pay so much for rent. 
That rent goes to the landlord. You don't see it anymore. They do whatever they want to with it. In our case, what we pay to Calam, most of it leaves the community. But it's still like an absentee landlord. And you're still paying rent in order to get that water. If you own it, like you own a house, you're still going to have to pay a bond. You're going to have to pay it out of your current budget. But you begin to acquire ownership at that point. And the issue is you don't pay both. You don't continue to pay rent while you're buying your house. There may be a transition, bridge loan or whatever it might be, might be necessary in the transition. But in the long term, you don't pay both. You pay one or you pay the other in exchange for a place to stay, live, uh, you know, a house or rental. That's the nature of what we're trying to explain here tonight and prior. Uh, and also I want to say, I want to tell you that green is exported from our community. Yellow obviously is. The red obviously is. So almost 50 cents, about 45 cents of every dollar that's collected by Calam leaves our community. Gone. But if we owned it, we think we can bring the green activity back into town. It's done somewhere else. It has to be done anyway. That means local economy needs a little bit of a growth, growth or boost or jobs locally, so we can keep the money local. It can turn locally. It can help the economy because it turns locally and stays locally. It doesn't get exported. That's a, another advantage we think of public ownership. That's my version. So we think the question is a simple one. Um, do you want corporate-owned water or do you want community-owned water? And the answer to that question will come after the feasibility study is done. Because once we get the facts, then we can have a serious debate about, well, what makes the most sense for this community? And don't forget, 85% of the country already has public water. We think the burden is on Cal-Am to prove that they're a better deal than publicly owned water. We think the burden's on them. We know the burden's have to be on us. It's going to have to be on the district to prove that public ownership works. But I think the burden in the argument is Calam has no defense for what it has been doing to us. They cannot defend. Uh, they not. They cannot um, defend the failures in the past. They cannot um, justify the high cost that exists right now. The high cost of our water bills. And look at the look at the campaign they have going right now. They're spending all sorts of money. To hang on. Why? We're a cash cow. That's why. We don't want to be a cash cow anymore. And it's been private ownership. The, 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 the water system in this area has been under private ownership from the very beginning. Back when the uh, Del Monte uh, Hotel was being built and so on, they needed more water than what was available. And it was a private owner, private developer that put in the initial dam. And it's been in private hands ever since. That's why we say 100 years of water for profit is wrong. And if we do not change anything, you can probably assume that things won't change. And you'll have Calam forever. We'll have the bills, the process, PUC, no local control, difficult access, somebody else is running things, exporting all your money, jobs go elsewhere. We deserve a better option. And we ought to look at it seriously. And that would be a, a yes vote on Jay. It gets us there. And um, we have some major endorsements. Uh, some of these uh, you may have already known about. Bill Monning and Mark Stone are recent. Uh, just yesterday, uh, Mary Adams joined this list, um, supervisor for the fifth district. Um, I think her, I think her commentary is going to be printed a second time tomorrow. That's what I've heard. Uh, but also, um, for star power, we have I think Clyde Rose, <laughs> Mayor Monterey. Many of you may know him. Sure. Well, a good evening, everybody. Very, very nice to see everyone. I uh, opened my mail today and I got uh, a flyer, and it was folded and said it was a blank check. And I went, "Good, I got a blank check." 
Well, to my disappointment, when I opened it, it was made out to the Monterey Peninsula Management Water District, and it was for a billion dollars. Oh, well. There goes, there goes my re-election campaign fund, right? So, I was so disappointed, I looked at the second flyer, and I said, oh, there's some pie. Well, then it turned out the pie was in the sky. So that didn't make me feel any better. Then I thought about an ad that they had published a while back, and it had an elephant in it, so I was going to get on my elephant to go downtown, but there was no elephant. Then another one of their ads had a pipeline to Phoenix, so I thought, well, if all else fails, we'll get our water for Phoenix, from Phoenix. Yeah. Well, anyway, it's very interesting, the advertisement. I, I just get a real kick out of it. So why, why would I be in support of Measure J. Well, I started with this four years ago before I came back as mayor. It's been my honor to be a four-term mayor here and a real privilege to be an elementary school teacher. So I'm just someone who, who lives in the community, likes it a lot, and I just want to get the facts. Feasibility studies are not, they're not that arcane and mysterious. George made several examples. If we want to remodel a bathroom and we need a loan, we're going to go to the bank and they're going to do a feasibility study. Can I afford it? If, as George talked about a car, if you want a car loan, you do a feasibility study. Can you afford it? When we put Measure S on the ballot for Monterey, we went out and we asked, the, did a survey, is it feasible? So we weren't just going to put it on the ballot to see uh, at large, was it feasible? And so we proceeded. So feasibility studies are not that uncommon. There's a little bit of confusion out there. I had the opportunity today to talk to some very nice people who are no on J. And they asked why I was yes on J. And I said, well, why are you no on J? Well, they said because it kills the desal plant. Oh. And I was talking to one of my neighbors, a very nice person. I'm helping her with a tree that's uprooting part of her driveway and so on. And she asked me about Measure J, and she said, well, doesn't that kill the desal plant? So I explained, no, it does not. And as George pointed out, a regional desal plant would really be the ideal way to go. So we have that misunderstanding. The feasibility study. We, then she said, well, doesn't Measure J make, make the, the district by cal -Am? No, it does not. It's a feasibility study. Oh, what does that mean? You get the facts, and if it makes sense, you buy it. And as you know, I've been active in this. Get the facts, get the facts, get the facts. I think as a, as a teacher, and all of you in your professions, you wanted to get the facts about things before you take the plunge. Oh, there's a good one. I wonder how Cal I missed that one. Don't take her, take the plunge. Deep dive. <laughs> deep dive. Okay. Come on, get the puns going, folks. <laughs> I'm in deep water here. Come on, help me out. <laughs> and so I was talking, no one does. Well then, um, my acquaintances who are no on J, highly respectful people, uh, it's, uh, well, how do we know if it's feasible because the water management district, they might just say it's feasible. And I said, well, you know where we really ought to put our effort? I strongly believe it's going to pass. Four years ago, it was about 50% in Monterey, 50% in Pacific Grove, 50% in Carmel, overwhelmingly defeated Measure O in Seaside and the un unincorporated county, as my memory goes. What if we had done that study four years ago? this conversation would be totally different. We would know, are we gonna buy it, or are we not? So I said to my friends, join us in the feasibility study. What, what do they say, money down the drain? Uh, it's money down the drain? And <laughs> by the way, my wife saw that ad and she said, no on what? I don't quite understand what no is. And I said, well, that's a J trap. She didn't see it. And they're paying these people $2 million. <laughs> and you don't, they don't even know what, the, what it's for. But anyway, and also a big, shiny public relations firm, but that's okay. So again, talking to my friend said, all right, you're really sure that this isn't feasible. You think it's worth a billion dollars. Well, hold the water management district's feet to the fire, or to the water, that was a bad one. <laughs> and make sure they do it correctly. I've been... Uh, 
in the city, I was uh, originally elected to the city council way back in 1981, and I've taken breaks and so on. But I've seen the Waters Management District go from pro-growth, air italics, <laughs> anti-growth, pro-growth, anti-growth. But they have been very much professional, and I think they have a credibility that they did not have in the past. So for me, it just simply gets down to, it's a feasibility study, is it feasible? Yes it is, no it isn't. And as pointed out, let's say the modern management district says it's feasible, they go ahead. Well, and if cal -Am fights it, then it's going to go to a judge and jury and they're going to say, well, I know what your feasibility study says, but you know what? It's not feasible because we think it's worth this. And they're also going to say it has to be in the public interest. So there's another safeguard. So I think it's something, the momentum is growing. Four years ago, I was kind of alone as a public official in support of this. And as you can see, there are uh, a lot of people are saying, let's get the facts, let's do the study. The momentum has really built up. And I think probably the, the most difficult thing for people to grasp is we're using much less water and our bill continues to increase, increase, increase. I think cal -Am owes us an explanation why that's true. And they think they have one. And that's fine too, because there's no good guys and bad guys here. We're simply looking at an issue. So that's why I say, let's do the feasibility study, let's get the facts. It's really that simple. One of the earlier slides um, talked about LM's failures and the desal project, the current desal project is in trouble. Well, as of Friday, Monday, as of Friday, two lawsuits were filed against the PUC decision and the desal project, all because of what they claim are, are flawed uh, EIR analyses. Uh, Marina Coast uh, filed against it, partly because Calam's taking their water, uninvited, and the city of Marina is also a second lawsuit, and they're affected by Calam's taking the water in their backyard. So uh, what what is what has happened here, uh, which was highly uh, speculated that would happen, has happened. The lawsuits have been filed, and uh, I don't know where that's going to go, but that's just a fact. Um, so let me go uh, head toward the end. We are very much a David and Goliath environment. Uh, they have almost two million dollars against us. We have spent about one hundred and twenty-five, one hundred and thirty thousand dollars for our side. So, um, a lot of money, a lot of money. And these things cost money. I was talking to a CSUMB class the other day, and I said I can't predict this, but instead of going to work for a water company, why don't you go to work for an ad firm? This is fun stuff. <laughs> I mean, the, granted, it's directed to us. You, you, this has got to be fun. Creating people, language, presentations, graphics, color, you know, getting your attention. This is fun, this is fun stuff for an advertising firm. We just have to do it. So we do, we're still looking for volunteers. We're in the home stretch. Uh, we're still looking for donations. And we still uh, feel like we're, we're, we're doing well. We are in the home stretch. We think we're ahead, but you know, you never know until you count the votes. But we want to finish strong. We want to finish strong. So to the extent that you can, in any position to help us, there are ways you can do it. Uh, take a yard sign, uh, help us with a donation, but also from the volunteer side. You know, this is a volunteer army. It's what, we, what we've got going here. Uh, the amount of money that we, have, that, that we have compared to their side of it really is a David and Goliath thing. We need to try to outsmart them, outwork them, out-volunteer them mainly because that's where our strength is, that's where you come in. And to the extent that we have volunteers in the street and volunteers on the phone, it helps make that person-to-person, one-to-one contact. cal has a lot of people in the street too. They pay young people and so on. If they ever come to your door, engage them in a conversation, at least try to. But you'll find out, oh, I don't know about that. Oh, I don't know about that. Oh, I don't know. They don't know what they're talking about. Our volunteers know a lot. And that one-to-one -one contact, and the enthusiasm that you have, if you're a yes, I mean, or no, it doesn't matter. The enthusiasm counts. It matters. The people they're sending door to door, there's just no enthusiasm. There's no nothing. It's just a hollow here. Hey, take this piece of paper. But we have real believers on our side. We have real believers. 
Many of you are that guy. I know I'm that guy. I know Billy's that guy. We just think there's so much potential that, that should be discussed as a policy issue for this area and as a, and as a, a utility service in this area. Should there be local control or not? Should you have access to all the information because it's down the street or you want to go to San Francisco? If there's going to be a rate discussion, you want to be able to talk to your, the very people going to make that decision. You don't do that up, you have to go to San Francisco to do that. Local control means something. Local watersheds mean something. Ruining a watershed means something. We know who's been doing that. And paying an affordable bill, too, for your water. And not feeling like you're a cash cow. You may feel like a cash cow anyway down the road. That may not be the issue. But right now we know with the highest cost of water in the entire United States, something is wrong with this picture and something is wrong with this community if we don't challenge that. Yeah, so the mics are on. If you go to the mic, then you can ask questions and we can move forward to the center. He knows everything. So the lights are here, so you don't have to. She wants to wear the tiny behind the podium. So, questions, go ahead. Oops, that's not on. Turn it on. <laughs> There's a little switch that goes up to the red light. Is that it? No. Try it. Tap your finger on it. Yeah, yeah. It's on. I'm an accountant, so I always like to see numbers. How close to the mic? Close. Closer. I said, I'm an accountant, so I always like to see numbers. And I haven't really seen any numbers about what you think this might cost to buy out in terms of what an average water user's bill might go up for the cost of buying this out. That's really what the feasibility study will do. Because we can't really, we don't have the resources to do that kind of analysis. We've given a pretty good estimate that we can do that it shouldn't go up. It should stay, you know, it, it'll either stay level or it might drop, but that, we can't know that until we actually have a figure of what Carolina is going to cost to buy it. Well, you haven't even got an estimate based on well, let's do it. Well, let, let me just let me add a few things. And Melody mentioned this. The rate base is a is a number that is recorded with within Calam and with the PUC, and it, it represents a value of Calam's assets. It's their prior investments, less depreciation, and that's a number. And that number is in all the documents about rates that are then they set rates, they start with that number. The annual reports kind of go around to make sure that number is clear. And that's $125 million. That number is in their reports. And what we're saying uh, that we've learned from experience and what we've done with our own research or what we hear from Missoula, with Ojai, with Felton, with Montero, all four of those successfully bought the corporate uh, ownership of their water. The, the settlement numbers is in the neighborhood of twice the rate base. So that's a $250 million number. So we're guessing $250, $300 million is probably a workable number. And that's what we have, and that's a third of what Callahan is saying is a billion. Yeah, I understand that, but it, let's say it's three hundred million. So, have you done any calculations to determine what the debt service on three hundred million buyout? We have those be? numbers. We have. And what? It's affordable within the existing revenue structure. What, what would it be for an average ratepayer? Well, the average ratepayer well, right now is paying your bill. over a hundred dollars a month. That's that's. 5,000 gallons a month, that's what Food and Water Watch says is the average across the country. It's pretty close to our local average. That's over $100 a month right now. So it's probably going to stay around that if we can't drop it, but we may be able to drop it. If you look at Ojai, okay, so they just did this, and they're in California, and they are, you know, about, what, half our size? And they were able to buy it do the repairs they need to do and, and really drop their water costs, which is what we would hope for. But that's what the feasibility study will show us. Yes, that's my other question. I've read the measure very carefully, and 
I see nothing in there that says anything about a feasibility study. I do see something oh, there that no, says... Oh, no, 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 no. It's all about feasibility. I'm sorry. If you read the measure, it says a the plan. fire district will prepare a plan. Plan. That's the feasibility study. That's what it says. Yeah. That is the feasibility study. Just different words. I, I interpret it differently. But that's just me. Well, and, that, and several places it says in there, if feasible. I mean, that's the whole basis of the facts, is getting the facts to determine what's, yeah, what are the next steps. That's what I'm looking for right now. Well, I'm and we won't know until the feasibility facts. study is done. We, okay. we can only do so much. All right. And we feel like the current water bills that you have are represented in this pie chart right now. We don't think that will go, whatever your current bills are, we expect that to continue, if not drop. We can't promise a drop. And, and, and even maybe the district, even after feasibility study, we don't know what they'll say. But hopefully it will lead to some reduction. But we don't know. We can't promise that. We don't. We're not. That's not our skill set. But here's the thing that what what always happens. Well, here's what you can promise: is that with Calam, your rates are going to continue to go like this. They always have. They always will. Every Felton, 2008, their water bills were 70 bucks a month. Calam asked for a 74 percent increase. That's where they went. Whoa! No way are we doing this. Their water bills now, 10 years later, have gone up 39%. Helen wanted 74% right then and there. Our water bills over 10 years, 170% increase. So with public ownership, what you get is a very slow cost of increase kind of rise, unless you've got some major issue you know, that happens, with, like you've got to repair the whole system or something. But with public, with private water, you get this very steep increase. So over time, yes, over time, you're going to save a lot of money. We don't know how much we'll save the first year or the first five years, but over time, you do save a lot of money. And that's pretty much proven by everyone that's done it. So I don't know why we would be any different. And the last little thing I want to say is that if you're buying a house and you finally burn a mortgage, your cost for your house goes way down. Right. And so that's the same thing here. In the long range, whatever the bond issue is, when that's over with, you own the system outright, and the cost of that system drops immensely. So it's a legacy issue, too. You know, if it does take us 30 years to finance it, I'm say, let's say we succeed and we go and we go ahead and, and everything happens and it's 30 years from now. I'm not going to be here to enjoy it. This is a long-term <coughs> generational, intergenerational issue. And, and, and you, you should appreciate that, you know, and, you, and, and understand that. But it's not going to happen within two or three or four years. Maybe five or six, and then it's the bond you pay off. But in the long run, in the long run, this uh, the the, pie to the uh, bar chart tells the story. Public agencies in general cost less than a corporate uh, provider, and th those are established systems. We're not there yet. Hopefully, it will be, and then we'll be on that scale. So there is a question. She's been waiting over there. Go ahead. Uh, I wanted to thank you for demystifying the whole process, and a couple of things came to mind. One is, I, I see this, it's great that some high-profile politicians and elected officials have signed on, and I'd like to thank the mayor of Monterey for being here tonight. Where is everybody else? I, like, I, it's just, I, my friends were kind enough to invite me to hear the mayor of Missoula. So I, that was my first event. I came and it, it was very enlightening and I took a sign and I went home and I talked to my family and we're all, you know, yes on Jay. It, so I, I don't understand why the mayor of Monterey was like the only one four years ago or one of the very few. The mayor of, of Missoula, I guess he was a, a really strong leader. He felt that very strongly that the public should own the water, and he, you know, he got behind that and pulled it off. So I, I'm curious why more more of our community leaders are not behind this. And then the other thing that just occurred to me as I was listening is every time you mentioned the PUC, it seemed like. Is that a colossal failure of responsibility, the PUC, or are they supposed to be holding um, American Water accountable, or is that not their role? Because it just seems like when you mentioned supposed that, to be their role. Okay. So is that it? Just if you were going to like expand the narrative a little bit to 
talk about how PUC fits in and maybe where, where it's gone wrong there. The PUC's job is to make sure that a corporation doesn't gouge the ratepayer. That's one responsibility. But they also, in effect, guarantee the continued existence of the, of the corporate utility. The very first paragraph of their responsibility reads something like this. Our responsibility is regarding the utility, and they, it's, water's not the only utilities they do, it's energy, a lot of energy and telecommunications. Uh, but the first paragraph says they will assure that there's a pro, uh, uh, an opportunity for profit, that uh, it can be attractive to uh, investors, and the bottom line will be positive. So if you're running a business and you've got somebody guaranteeing that you will make enough money to be a profit, that you will have investors, and that your bottom line is going to be positive, that's a good deal. It's guaranteed. So the oversight that they provide is to guarantee the continued existence of the utility, not the quality of the water, the public access, transparency, or whatever. And so, there, so we get rid of the PUC if we succeed with this. We get rid of them. They're no longer in the picture. It's local control, local people making local decisions that are your neighbors. I wanted to say something about the political leadership. Um, I've been having this uh, back and forth with Sam Farm. Talk about political leadership. So he continues to say that uh, he doesn't like uh, citizen initiatives like this, and that he thinks, you know, the water management district should just do the feasibility study. Well, the water management district, on the other hand, says, well, we want the public to tell us that, yes, if we're going to go spend this money, we want to know that the public really wants to do this. So, there's been kind of this catch-22 where the political leadership has been, eh, we don't really want to stick our neck out, we'll just wait. So it fell to us, a citizen group to put the pressure on politically to get people on board. And now, I mean, Clyde was always on board, but now you won't find very many politicians in this season saying we're no on Jay. They wouldn't dare because they know that it's too popular right now. So what they'll say is if they're really against it, they'll say they're neutral. <laughs> it's like they're not. But um, we have a lot of political support now. Bill Monning was very funny. When we asked him if he would endorse, he goes, what took you so long to ask? <laughs> Go ahead. I, I think that uh, one of the reasons, you had a, a bunch of mayors, except for Mayor Roberson, who were afraid that if there were a change of horses midstream, that the, the, uh, the order to cut back on the water, the, the extension of, of giving, giving some time to comply with that, that the State Water Resources Board would say, you guys can't get your act together, we're putting the hammer down, you've got to cut back, and the results will be draconian. So it was a big scare kind of thing. That, I mean, that was my take on it, that, well, don't change horses now, you know, we're almost there. Yeah. Well, it's four years later, and we're, we're still not almost there. So yeah, it's like, right. well, how, how long is it going to take? My, one of my questions is, of the 7,000 acre feet, Am I right in assuming that 3,500 of that, which is Monterey One water? Next year. Yeah, okay. So it's not there yet, but it's close within the 2021 window, right? Yeah, and okay, it's, it's so, already done deal. I mean, it'll be delivering next right. year. Right. So just in the interest of accuracy, I think that's important. The other question I have is what do you do with obligations, debts, lawsuits that, that, that are hanging over Calab's head? If you acquire this system, does all that baggage come with it? Um, everything that Callahan says is an obligation of theirs will probably be in the feasibility analysis from their side. They will be arguing that. And to the extent that uh, eminent domain is kind of the, the, the Super Bowl of determining value, that's when all of those arguments will come out. I, I don't know what, to what extent their obligations are, existing contracts, uh, union contracts. I mean, who knows what all these are? And we don't have access to that information. But the, fees, but the uh, eminent domain process is where both sides share, they're supposed to share, uh, through discovery, a lot of information that may never hit the public, uh, that we may never learn about, unless it goes to eminent domain. But every, everything, let's, let's take the desal project so far, it's being hung up in litigation as of this weekend, but let's say that it sits there during this feasibility study, that will be an asset for Cal -Am. 
They have made an investment. They paid for it. It's a partly there. It's not completed, but it's partly there. It'll be an asset that'll be in Calam's argument for what you owe us. If you're going to buy it, you buy a half project or a third or whatever it is. That will be all discussed in, 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 the, in, the, uh, in the domain procedure if it goes that far. If it doesn't go that far, it's probably because the parties are finding a way to agree without going to court. And again, they'll have to discuss all these things because it has to be, uh, it's, it's got to be global. So it's got to include the whole, the whole picture for Kelly. You know, talking about the desal, because it, that, there was something else I wanted to say about this conversation I was having with Sam Farm. He continues to say that public water now is against growth, that we're trying to stop the desal plant. We have no way of stopping that desal plant, and neither do you. Nobody can stop that desal plant except the California Public Utilities Commission or the California the Coastal Commission. We have no say, no choice in whatever CalAM does. So this is a ridiculous argument that anyone would say that Public Water Now is trying to stop the desal plant. There's no way. I mean, unfortunately, CalAM hasn't been very wise in what they've done to create this project because if they were going to take water with no water rights and count on that and then end up being sued by Marina, uh, you know, that's that's on them. We didn't do that. Anyway, who was first? Go ahead. Uh, I'm definitely for this. Um, I've noticed that Calian, they've got a bunch of catchy slogans and they've spent all this money on advertising. And I think it is some people who don't know about the issue, I think it's sticking in their heads. I had to tell a colleague at work today about it and explain that it wasn't just buying it, it was actually doing a feasibility study. So I think it's really important that we get the message out there and the information out there. And I've seen you guys have been running Facebook ads and stuff like that, but I think that's really important that we continue to do that. Um, on Nextdoor, that's a really good tool as well. And so I would just ask that, like, if I want to share something on Nextdoor from uh, Public Water Now, can I, is there information I can take from Absolutely. your website and share on there yeah. just to get the word out there? Because I think coming down the stretch, it's really important. Any uh, link on the website, you can just copy it and put it right on Nextdoor. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We need everybody to really help because we don't have $1.87 million to reach 60,000 voters. It's really up to those of you that are hearing this and getting it to help spread the message. Uh, I'm, I'm unclear as to uh, why the feasibility study could not be carried out. Well, why do we have to vote for a feasibility study? Why can't we not just carry it out? You have to ask the water management district why they didn't do it in all these years. Um, California is unique in, in the states to have what's called a recall and a, a referendum and initiative. There are three places where citizens can act in their interest in order to make a change in their government. And so recall means you could recall a candidate that you don't like. Uh, referendum is that if there's a law you don't like, you can rescind it. An initiative is if you think there ought to be a law or an action, you can start it. So California is very interesting to have three ways that the citizens have a way to influence their government outside of the election process, outside of the standard election process. What we've done, and this is in response to what Sam Farr has said too, he doesn't like the initiative process, it's a law, it's available to the public. In California, it's used a lot. Maybe it's abused somewhat. We don't feel like we're abusing it, we're using it. The district has had the authority, since they were formed, since 1978, the district has the authority to do exactly what we're asking them to do. Well, that's my, that's my question. And they haven't chose to do it. Why? I don't know, you find a reason. What we found is, over 40 years, whatever, they haven't done it. We're asking them to do it. We're asking them to do it. Thank you. And, and that's and that's available to us. And if we didn't ask them, how much longer would we wait for them to act? Another forty years? I don't know. Yeah. The initiative is available, and it is an it's an asset in California, and it's really an, an asset to the to the voting public that they have these these channels available to them. What's the condition of the matter as the public interest? Yeah, both have to demonstrate the public. Interest. Yeah, this is a good point. There are two, two factors to the feasibility study. It's got to be in the public interest, and it's got to be financially feasible. And both of those questions will be, process, uh, will be addressed in the feasibility study. 
Is it in the public interest? Is it affordable? Go ahead. I'm going to sound very stupid, but what is the difference between the Monterey Peninsula Water Management District and the, is it the same as the group you're saying has not ever asked for a feasibility study? Yes, yes it is the same. same. The Water Management District, <laughs> since 1978, had the ability to do the feasibility study and to buy CalM. They have that authority. And that's why somebody and they have would not be good done it. on that. Yes. <laughs> right. Wait, say that again. And that's why somebody like George would be good to have <laughs> yes. on that yes. All right. George is running for one of the seats on right, the water. Right. So I just came from the Carmel Mayor's discussion group, and uh, Dave Potter, who I've heard, is not for yes on Jay. <coughs> so, mm -hmm. Dave Potter is no, no on Jay. Say no more there. But anyway, but his uh, comment in the meeting when he was asked about it was, I guess, that same thing you're saying, Sam Farr was saying that he doesn't like, he doesn't approve of what you called, I can't remember what he said, but initiative process. Right. It's a citizen's initiative. And he said it's not democratic. <laughs> <laughs> so I would like you to explain why that is probably. I don't know. The two of them have been talking, you can tell. Right? <laughs> they both, they both but, agree. But you know, I used to vote for Sam Farrow, and I used to vote for Dave Potter when he was running for supervisor, but now I'm getting a little upset because I don't understand what this point of the initiative process being so bad and it's not democratic, that's his line. That was his main line, so you just should know that. His main <laughs> dry enough. Well, Dave Potter sat on the Water Management District Board for about 20 years. So that, the person that asked why did they never do it, that would be a good question for Dave Potter, who now says, oh, I'll, I will, I'll force them to do it if they won't, if the initiative fails. And it's like, really? Now? Why not back when you were a member of that board? Because now he just is not on it. Could I ask the lady the question at Go ahead. the meeting today? Uh, you said in the microphone. The microphone. Oh, the yeah, sorry. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Now, you said that Potter said that he's not he's going to vote no on Jay. Did anybody ask if he has received any money for his campaign from Calum? <laughs> <laughs> no, they didn't ask. No, no one asked. Okay. What is his interest in him? <laughs> Good question. Um, some people dislike, someone mentioned something about some points of just grow. Some people dislike the uh, initiative process because it has been hijacked recently by very wealthy people who can just afford to pay signature gatherers to go out and uh, get something on the, get enough signatures to get terrible things on the ballot. There was one that was anti-gay uh, a few years ago that I think the, uh, uh, the state attorney general has just said I'm not putting that on the ballot. So some people feel don't like the initiative process because of that. But I say thank God we have the initiative process because otherwise we wouldn't be able to do this. now. Another question is said, well, why haven't these people on the water management district done this? Um, and uh, George said he, he didn't know, or maybe you should ask them. George is too nice to tell you why. Luckily, I'm not. <laughs> the majority of the people on the water management district board right now are in Calam's pocket. Calam has successfully turned the residents of Monterey Peninsula Water Management District against the business community and vice versa, the business community against the residents. About five years ago, Calam lowered um, the cost of water to business by taking them off the tiered rates that we have. They used to be on tiered rates, right. and a hotel used to pay a lot more money than it does now for the same amount of water. Well, as a result of this business interest, the Hospitality Association, uh, that's the hotel people mostly, uh, the restaurant people, the realtors, the various chambers of commerce, there's one in every city, I think, they will now kill to keep Cal I am. I'm a realtor and I'm for you. All right! There's one, there's one in every crowd. Thank you. But the vast majority of them are opposed to this uh, for that reason. This is really a terrible thing. And it comes when people say to me, what is local uh, uh, control of water policy mean? Because we say we think that this is a good idea because it will bring down our rates and it will give us local control. I say, you know, if the democratically elected directors of a water management district 
deciding that a glass of water at my house and your house should cost more than a glass of water at a hotel, we could go and say to them, we think this is wrong and outrageous. And if you don't reverse this and make the costs equal for everyone, residents and businesses, we're going to throw you out of office next election. That's what democracy is all about. But when the board of directors of Calamp's parent company in New Jersey, American Water Works, makes a decision like that, we have absolutely no influence over it. Another thing is that most people don't understand that Calium is charging us between 50% and 100% more than just the cost of delivering the water. So if the cost of the water is this much, Calium is charging us that much. This is why Marina Coast Water District, our little uh, neighbor to the north, provides water to the people in Marina at about half the cost of Cal Am. Right. Cal Am doesn't have any costs that Marina Coast doesn't have. Marina Coast just charges the people in Marina what it costs to deliver the water to them. Cal Am charges twice that much. So yeah. when we get rid of Cal Am, and all that the water management district is charging us is what it costs to deliver our water, plus the cost of the bonds, we think that's going to be a lot less than what Calium is charging us now, which is why both the communities of Ojai in Southern California and Missoula, Montana, have found that their water bills have gone down, even though they're paying off the bonds. So please don't think that your water bill is going to be what it is now, plus the cost of the bonds. It's not. And one, one thing I was going to say about Felton, because Calam likes to use Felton as an example, Felton is a tiny little water system with about 1,400 connections. We have 40,000. And their system was very damaged because of it had been neglected for years under private ownership. So when they bought it, they intended to use the savings that they were going to have on repairing their system. And that's what they've done. That's why their water rates have not dropped, because they've had to do a lot of infrastructure repair. But that's, they anticipated that, and they don't have an economy of scale. So using Felton is a little bit, you know, it's not, it's not like our system at all, because it's so tiny. But anyway, that was an important distinction that Calam will not make in their flutters. There was a question behind you. Can he ask his question, or did you already ask one? Uh, could I ask another one? Yeah, but why don't you let him go first? Okay. <laughs> I'll just take a minute. I want uh, to ask a question. And if I we'll put it up. There you go. Pull. Fantastic. Okay, you're done? Yeah, Okay. Uh, I have a, a question and uh, a comment. The question is about the billing system. I keep hearing that we're going to have to invent and produce a new billing system. And it seems to me that's part of Calam that ought to be delivered with the system. And uh, I'd like to get some sort of response to that. Well, maybe not. They have a billing system that is services all of California. So we'd have to do a carve out. It's very possible we're going to have to get the information from Calam and put it into a new billing system. Okay, so that's, not, that's not a huge problem. Uh, no, Dave Stoll, we asked Dave Stoll said that's not. Right. Right. It just keeps coming up, and it seems to me to make not a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, okay. The, it's also uh, a local business, as opposed to being done somewhere else. Yeah. Yes, it would be it's it's another piece, piece of the piece right. of what we keep. Yeah. Right. Um, and uh, so the, the income from that contract or whatever it is that you do in order to get the billing system stays here. And that's that's the plan. Right. That's the whole. Yeah. Anyway, the, uh, the other comment I want to make is that, or the, the comment I want to make is about the question of the 20% or more uh, in the profit column uh, and 10% that's guaranteed by uh, the PUC. But that 10% is 10% rate of return to the investors, which means that's 10% of the uh, rate base, whereas what we're interested in is 10% of the 
the revenue becomes, I mean, 10% of the rate base becomes 20% of the revenue because the revenue is half of the rate base. So the 20% is correct if you're talking about profit, and I just want people to understand that, that there's no problem in the 20% figure you give. It's, it's actually, or 20 or 20. 25. Yes. That, that's actually correct, even though people keep saying 10%. And it's based on Callahan's own financial reports. Right. Um, I just want to say if if we should probably just take one more question and wrap it up. But um, sure. if you're or two, okay. If you yeah. uh, want to be on the contact email list here for future updates, once Major J passes, we'll keep updating people on what's going on. Make sure you sign this there out front. Just your name and email is all we need to keep in touch. Go ahead. Um, I have two questions. Um, and take a sign. Oh, take a yard sign if you're leaving, because we have plenty. Go ahead. Uh, okay, I have two questions. Uh, number one, uh, how much does it cost the taxpayer for the feasibility study? Number two, um, if uh, Monterey uh, Water Management District has the authority to do the feasibility uh, study uh, and they hasn't done that, how can um, we guarantee that they would do the right thing for the people if um, Measure J is passed um, in terms of transparency, um, in the interest of the people in, the, in Monterey County? Well, Measure J will be a law. It says they need to do this in the interest of the public. So now the pressure is on to do the right thing. Before it was like, well, we don't really have to do it. Nobody's telling us we have to do it. But now they will have to do it. And there will be changes in the water board where people will be coming on the water board that are more enthusiastic about doing this than maybe some of the past people that are no longer on that board were. If the right people are elected. Right, if the right people are elected. And there's a few. George, uh, George, George and Alvin Edwards need to be elected. And then someone has to be appointed to Bob Evans' seat. So, or Bob Brower, sorry. Um, but the quest about the money, there's no tax. It's paid for by the Water Management District. They already have that money in their reserves. There's no tax, no property tax involved in this whatsoever. Thank you. OK, one more, and we'll wrap it up. OK. My question is not whether we can afford to buy it or not. My question is, can we afford to keep Calvin? <laughs> Okay, so, can we trust Kalman to, to manage our most precious resource, which is the water, in a very safe, sustainable, and environmentally friendly way? The, my experience, our experience is no, because they haven't done anything for 52 years. They have only raised our rates. And I'm telling you that all this the documentation they're sending to us are not, if not lies, they are deceiving, uh, uh, distorting the truth. How could we trust a company that distorts the truth to our, to, to, the, uh, to the people that they are the, using the water, the, our community? The other thing is, I wanted to give a, just a little experience that I had with uh, a government of, uh, with the Irvine Branch Water District, which is a public water district. I lived in Irvine for 30 years, and that was uh, beginning in, in the 1970s. Our monthly bill was always reasonable, less than $30 a month and to best serve the water needs of the fast-growing city, which was the fastest-growing city, the agency was always very proactive in developing a variety of solutions to have an adequate supply of water at all times at a reasonable cost. And they, they were the, one of the first ones to implement a wastewater recycling program and an urban runoff tr treatment facility and purification of the water. So I'm saying that public water is the only way that is feasible. Yes. 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 Yes.
I just want one, one wrap up comment. I don't think anybody should fear that Calam is going to sabotage the system or any of that stuff. They're, they're, they, they have you a, mean the water management? Uh, well, sabotage anything. You said Calam's going to sabotage. No, that's what I'm saying. You should not fear that Calam is going to do anything you know, to undermine the water system that they have, the delivery system. Whether you trust them or not, no, just listen to me. Just listen to me. They have an obligation to provide water. It's a requirement that they have the permit from the PUC to do that. It's got to meet safety standards. It, it, it'll have to be a, uh, a smooth transition to public ownership if that's what we also So why doing. haven't they developed any new source of water? Well, that's... Okay, so how can you trust a company that doesn't know do what is necessary to provide the correct water? I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to say they're angels. angels. All I'm trying to say is they have an obligation to provide water. If you feel like you, you, you're suspect of whatever they might do, don't be. This is a... Wait a minute, wait a minute. This is an issue about corporate ownership, not the people who run for Cal Am, nor their obligation, nor their obligation uh, to, the, to the public. It's, a, it, it's not a personnel issue, it's not a personality issue, it's not a people issue. It's a corporate issue, the structure is wrong, PUC plays a too strong a role in, in managing what should be local control. That's the issue. It's, it's, a, it's not a personality issue or a personal issue. Could I just it's, say one more thing, one other thing? I may want to respond and then just move on and on. Why don't you guys do it? Why don't you guys do it privately? One other thing. One other thing. How could Cal Am have the water in the Thank you. 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 Thank you.